Hey everyone, this is lecture 7.1 on social class. In this lecture, we're going to talk about some basic concepts surrounding social class, theories of social class, and poverty itself. So, social inequality is defined as the unequal distribution of wealth, power, or prestige among members of a society. Social stratification, then, is the division of a society into groups arranged in a social hierarchy. So, stratification, then, is how inequality is organized. Every society has some form of stratification, and variations on stratification include items such as criteria, which would be race, class, gender, social class, etc., systems of stratification, and severity of stratification. How bad is it actually for those people being oppressed? And how good is it for those people really enjoying the benefits? Income, then, is the amount of money a person or household earns in a given period of time. This can include job salary, investments, things like Social Security, or disability income. Income is typically spent on food, clothing, shelter, health care, and other costs of daily living, especially when we're talking about people who are middle class, working class, and poor. The median U.S. income is decreasing, and these numbers are slightly dated, but it does show a general trend. In the year 2000, the average household income was just over $63,000, while in 2011, it was $55,000. Over that decade, that represents a, dec a decline of more than 12%. Wealth, then, is the value of everything a person owns. This includes especially property that earns money. Marx calls that wealth, then, productive property. Wealth is built up over a lifetime, and especially among the wealthy, it is passed down from one generation to the next to create certain opportunities. Common examples of wealth include items such as stocks, bonds, and real estate. These are items that you own that will make you an amount of money. The, the most typical form of wealth in the United States is home ownership. When we study the scope of human behavior, we see that there are actually many systems of stratification. These include systems such as slavery, in which human beings are actually owned by other human beings, apartheid or segregation, in which certain portions of the population are prohibited from certain, uh, certain facilities or territories within the organization. We have caste systems, such as the uh, infamous Indian caste system, which was outlawed in the 1940s, and the American class system, which is the system in which we live. And the system of class in the United States is often ignored by many Americans, even though it has very real effects. Social class, then, refers to the system of stratification based on access to resources. This can include items such as income, wealth, power, and prestige. Marx focused primarily on income and wealth, while Max Weber focused, focused on income, wealth, power, and prestige. And there is a difference there. Sociologists sometimes refer to social class as socioeconomic status. SES, socioeconomic status, is not always synonymous with class, but often very quantitative sociologists will make the assertion that SES is an equivalent to social class, and for more, most cases, it is. Social mobility, then, is the movement of individuals or groups within the hierarchical system of social classes. This, in, and I color coded this slide to show you the ideas that most closely um, can be compared with each other. Intergenerational mobility then is the movement between social classes that occurs from one generation to the next. So your parents did something to improve or harm uh, your financial situation, and because your parents did that, it created the system, the situation that you are in right now. Intragenerational mobility, then, is the movement between social classes that occurs over the course of an individual's lifetime. 
so you did something to create your position in the class system. Hor then we have horizontal and vertical social mobility. This is the occupational movement of individuals or group within one social class. So what this looks like is you quit one job or uh, you go get a different job that is about the same as the job you currently have, that's horizontal social mobility. So let's say you quit working at, um, at a grocery store and then you go uh, work at Target, just about the same position in the class hierarchy, that's horizontal mobility. Vertical mobility then is the movement between social classes and is often called, depending on the direction, either upward mobility or downward mobility. So let's say you go get a better job. Let's say you go from working at the grocery store to um, doing some sort of clerical work that pays better and has better benefits. That is upward vertical social mobility. Or you quit the grocery store and you go work at a fast food place that has worse pay and benefits. That is downward vertical social mobility. Now, often we think of social mobility on an individual scale, and all of the examples I just gave were individual, but sometimes social mobility occurs on the structural scale in which entire portions of society are shifted from one position in the class status to another. Um, a good example of this would be a small town that has something like a steel mill or an auto plant, and then that auto plant closes and everyone loses their job. That is an example of downward vertical structural mobility. And it can certainly also go upward as well. Economic polarization then is the modern phenomena of rich people becoming richer and everyone else becoming poorer. Now, this certainly was a topic that was addressed rather extensively by Marx in the mid 1800s, but we have seen this process exacerbate and get stronger and stronger since the 1970s. Why? Since the 1970s, manufacturing jobs in the United States have been replaced increasingly by service sector work, and service jobs have lower pay, fewer benefits, and are less likely to be unionized while union workers typically have higher pay and better benefits. Thus, if you're a member of a union, you're more likely to be a little bit more advantaged in terms of social class. Now let's talk about some positions within the class system. Uh, the upper class. These are the wealthiest people in our class system. We often talk about them as being the 1% of the US population. They possess most of the wealth in the country. So they possess most of the things that actually make money. The, the money that they have is overwhelming wealth. And they do have an income, but that is not where most of their um, money that they, they can spend is. They have a strong tendency then towards social isolation. So uh, the 1% uh, prefers things like private clubs, private schools, uh, as opposed to going to uh, a public pool, for example, or um, having your kids in public schools. You probably will never meet a member of the 1% uh, of uh, this class because of the fact that they do tend to isolate themselves. They drive, they fly in private jets. Additionally, then, the upper class have a tendency to scale back, at least when they're in public, their actual appearance of being super duper wealthy, right? Um, this is, it's a, it's a very interesting phenomena. Their clothing tends to be a little bit more subdued unless you analyze it super closely. We see this with celebrities and uh, certain, certain public individuals like Mark Zuckerberg. In this picture, he looks like he's wearing just your standard black hoodie. But if you look carefully, you'll see that it is not sagging in the same places where your hoodie would be sagging. And it's probably made of a very expensive material. That is because this hoodie has been custom made for Zuckerberg and probably is hundreds, if not possibly thousands of dollars.
The upper middle class then are professionals and managers in our society. They make up about 14% of the total US population. And if you know some rich people, these are probably the rich people you know. I have an aunt that uh, owns a, uh, a number of radiology clinics. She's a very clear example of an upper middle class individual. The upper middle class, as opposed to the upper class, do have a tendency toward conspicuous consumption, which means they tend to spend money in which other people can see it, right? They have not only large houses, but large houses where other people can see them. They have very fancy cars. They um, do have a slight tendency to dress very fancy when they know people are going to see them and not scale back and be more subtle the way the 1% does. The middle class then are typically white collar workers. White collar workers are those who do their jobs more typically based on thinking rather than doing physical tasks. They make up about 30% of the US population. Now at one time in the United States, white collar workers were very much things like accountants or salespeople, or again, certain types of skilled clerical workers. In modern American society, uh, white collar workers uh, are often uh, tech workers, often trained medical staff, the types of people that make their money via um, using their brains as opposed to moving things or doing physical things. Working class workers then, or sometimes called blue collar or service industry workers, um, or yeah, Working class workers are often called blue collar workers, and that is actually tied to the historic tendency of blue collar work to be tied with manufacturing. Workers in some place like a steel mill, an automotive plant, whatever, will um, can't really wear uh, fancy clothes with white shirts, with those white collars, right? That's where the term blue collar comes from because their clothing was either black or blue during that era. Uh, Continuing into this day, the work of the working class is cl closer tied to physical labor, and they are less likely to have college degrees. However, in recent uh, decades, we have seen an uptick of what working class workers who do actually have college degrees. They make up about 30% of the total US population, and examples of working class workers in the modern era are retail workers, professional restaurant staff, and landscapers. Now, the working class, I'm sorry, the lower class, sometimes called working poor, these people are more likely to access public assistance programs because the jobs that they do often are not enough to pay all of their bills without help from the government. They are likely to, more likely than other classes to be in a state of relative poverty We'll talk about that in a couple slides. And they often have lower levels of literacy than other classes. Now that doesn't mean that lower class workers are stupid. It means that they're very tired. Often uh, lower class workers have to work multiple jobs, often multiple very low paying jobs to make ends meet. So after they're done with their 12 hour day and then they actually put their kids to sleep, they're not really in the mood for reading very detailed, in-depth literature, for example. Lower class workers make up about 20% of the to total US population. And as I mentioned, they are more likely to work multiple jobs than other uh, classifications of workers. Then we have the underclass. Often the working poor are defined, are, are sometimes who we think of as poor, but there is uh, a category of more poor. These people are, are very likely to be in a condition of absolute poverty as opposed to relative poverty. Again, I'll talk about that in a few minutes. They are likely to be fully dependent on public assistance and they may potentially be engaged in illegal activity to survive. We talked about this in our lecture on deviance, especially relating to strain theory the reason why a lot of people commit crimes is because they want money because they can't get money otherwise. 
And so many people who commit acts of deviance that can be explained by strain theory are of the underclass. The annual household income of underclass people is often less than $7,500 a year, which is quite a low amount of money if you're, you know, if you're at the point where I was when I was in college and not really paying my own bills. You'll observe in this picture of a underclass uh, neighborhood, uh, the, the rundown quality of it. That is created by a cyclical effect uh, known as the culture of poverty in which things get broken down. A lot of people can't fix what they can't get fixed. So they get used to a certain level of, of kind of not being kept up. And then you'll also notice that one of those buildings has sex club written on the back. In all likelihood, that's not a sex club, but the people living in that house simply are too tired, too worn down to take care of that situation of that thing being spray painted on the back of their house. They're very, very tired. Now let's talk about some theories of social class. Obviously, conflict theory has a lot to say about social class. It's really what it's all about. Marx observed that there are two primary classes in capitalist societies, being the capitalist or bourgeoisie class and the worker or proletariat classes. Marx observed that what separates the capitalist from the worker is that the capitalist owns the means of production, i.e. they own the wealth that makes things. Workers then sell their labor for wages because they do not own the factories, the grocery stores, the farmland. The only thing they have to make a living is selling their labor to the capitalist. And we, we have talked previously in this course about this. This is just a little bit of a review. Additionally, Marx observed that classes would remain divided and social inequality would grow. And he also acknowledged that there are other classes, but they're not as central to the primary struggle of the, uh, of that's core to society. Marx really um, strongly believed that what drove society was this dynamic between the bourgeoisie and the proletariat, despite the fact that there are other, there are many people that don't fall into one of those two categories. The Iberian social theory then offered a similar model that included cultural factors. So while Marx only focused on wealth and to a degree income, Weber focused on the power of the individual. So how much social influence does that individual have in an area and the prestige of the individual? How important do people think or how impressed are people by those individuals? Now, often wealth, power, and prestige are all tied together, but sometimes there are people that have one but don't have the others. If you win the lottery, um, and you're not a public figure, you might get a great degree, degree of wealth, but not really have any power or prestige. In the most classical sense, uh, we look at someone like a Catholic priest, especially those priests who take vows of poverty. They might um, be quite well, um, might be mediumly powerful. They might have a lot of prestige in their uh, community, but in terms of their personal property, they, they actually have very little. Functionalist theory then suggests that systems of stratification emerge because they are functional in many ways. Certain roles then are more important for the functioning of society, and these roles may be more difficult to fill so that greater incentive is needed. Thus, greater rewards are necessary for work that requires more training and more skill. Now, this model of social class was very popular in the United States for quite some time. However, there is a major, um, and this is a critique that's pointed out by conflict theorists, that yes, we do need to pay surgeons more because only certain people can be surgeons and there needs to be a certain incentive uh, for people to train that long, that hard to become a surgeon. But what about CEOs that make 400 times as much money as the average worker? Do those people really work 400 times harder 
than the average person working at the uh, corporation, that is possibly something that could be argued, that they don't. Pierre Bourdieu then. Bourdieu is not closely tied to any of the three core theories. In fact, he's a postmodernist theorist. Bourdieu attempted to explain the phenomena of social reproduction, which is the tendency for social class status to be passed down from one generation to the next. Reproduction is the phenomena. According to Bourdieu, this happens because each generation requires cultural capital, cultural capital being the process through which the phenomena of social reproduction occurs. So cultural capital includes items such as tastes, habits, expectations, skills, knowledges, and help, and these all help individuals to gain advantages in society. Thus, when you go into a job interview and you have the same cultural capital as somebody that you're interviewing with, then they say things like, well, I think you're a good fit for the position. Because often when people are interviewing people, they're trying to find people that they can that work that they could work with, maybe that they like. And that often takes the form of cultural capital. We have things in common with these people. We're of the same class status. Cultural capital can either help or hinder us as we become adults. It really depends on the situation in which you're in. If you have the same cultural capital as someone, i.e. if you're in the same social class as someone, then that can help you. But if you don't have the same cultural capital, then it could get in your way. Now, a little bit on symbolic interactionism. Uh, symbolic interactionists examine the ways that we use status differences to categorize ourselves and others. And as Goffman pointed out, our clothing, speech, gestures, possessions, friends, and activities all provide information about our socioeconomic status. When you look at a person's clothes, when you look at the cars they drive or the home they live in, you can see a tremendous amount about their actual social status and their position in the class hierarchy. And so a lot of that is obvious, some of it isn't as obvious. Now let's talk for a moment about poverty. Relative deprivation is a relative measure of poverty based on standards of living. People are considered poor then if their standard of living is less than that of other members in society or in their community. If everyone around you is rich, if everyone around you can afford to go on three vacations a year and have fancy cars, but you cannot afford that, you then are in a position of relative deprivation. However, if you're living in a very poor town, but you can pay all your bills, you have good medical care, and you can afford to go on a vacation now and then, then that means that you are in a position of actual relative privilege. Absolute deprivation then is the objective measure of poverty that is defined by the inability to meet minimal standards for food, shelter, clothing, or health care. Thus, absolute deprivation which people who are in the underclass often are in means that your economic status, your poverty is actually hurting your health. That's what absolute deprivation is. Now the federal poverty line is frequently used to determine who should and should not be categorized as poor. And people under the poverty line typically are in a state of absolute poverty. We see that this, these federal poverty guidelines vary based on your actual lived situation. So for example, I live in a household of four individuals. So if I was making 100% of poverty, uh, that would mean that, and 100% means your total income, right? If my household of four people, we earned $26,500 or less, we would be then considered to be in poverty. Now, the reason we have these variations of 138, 150, 200, and 400 percent is there are certain government uh, uh, policies and certain um, thing, certain government assistance programs that say, okay, if you're making twice as much as poverty, if you're making $53,000 a year, only $53,000 a year. Um, and you have a household of four people, 
we there are certain things we don't want you to have to go through we don't want you to not have heat in the winter time if you can't afford it or if you're in a hot place air conditioning in the summertime so thus heating assistant programs are one example of a program that actually um, is at that 200 percent level because we don't want people freezing to death now the poverty rate in 2021 was about nine percent which is sociologically rather intriguing um, this uh, the poverty rate over the span of the 2000s was relatively low, but then we see this dramatic dip um, at the latter part of the 2010s. And it could be that that dip in uh, poverty may have been uh, created by uh, the COVID relief programs that many of us got in um, 2020, 2019 and 2020. Uh, that may have actually had the impact of raising uh, the collective good while the, those monies were being redistributed by the government. Of course, with that all said, that's a hypothesis. And it would be at this moment in time, we'd still need a couple more years to really prove that hypothesis thoroughly. Finally, the culture of poverty refers to learned attitudes that can develop among poor communities and lead the poor to accept their fate rather than attempt to improve their situation. So, uh, for example, if you grew up in a poor area, and I grew up in a pretty poor area, you go off to college and you're trying to educate yourself, make your position a little bit better, maybe get out of that area or maybe just get more educated so you can get a better job. You will hear certain things from people that did not make those choices or maybe weren't capable, maybe, maybe weren't smart enough, or maybe they just couldn't afford to go to college. So you go back and you hear things like, oh, so you think you're better than me now? Well, that, that might be a little bit mean, but that is that person coping with the fact that they see that they can't escape. They see that they can't do those things. It is a individual or maybe collective also coping mechanism. Uh, my cousin, my, I have a cousin that says to me pretty regularly, and I, I grew up in a poor town. She says, oh, Jeremy, you should move home. You need to move home and there aren't any jobs for me there right that, that that's a big component and you we also things like we also hear things like people saying we have everything we need right here do you really do you have the same social service programs in this very poor destitute town than you would in a, a better town maybe you might but you probably don't all of these assumptions are elements of the culture of poverty. Okay, that is it for this lecture. If you have any questions, please just let me know.